It's Friday. Let's get into it. Cue theme song. <clears throat> uh, first off, camera tweak. Um, I messed with the picture profile a little bit. I'm still in portrait, but I boosted some stuff with the hopes of not having to color correct anything and kill the noise reduction. And then I also d turned off um, eye dynamic and eye resolution because I don't actually understand what they do. Um, I think eye dynamic is similar to Sony's dynamic range op optimizer, where it sort of like pretends to give you more you know, dynamic range, so everything that's dark is brought up and everything that's bright is brought down, but I don't, I don't know how to use it, so it, it, experiment. Um, on top of that, I'm also trying my shotgun mic again. Hopefully this time I have the mic levels correct and it's not going to be super noisy, but it might just be I have a $25 shotgun mic. Uh, but in defense of that, I've been that's the shotgun mic I use um, when I go on set for teeny tiny stuff, and that's the shotgun mic that is at the end of my boom pole. Um, but also it goes into a field recorder, so even if the mic is crappy, the field recorder is better than what the camera is capable of. So maybe it could be that this mic is fine, and it could be that this mic is just very, very cheap and not very good. Uh, Playing this on YouTube will probably answer that question. Um, so yes, a lot of camera stuff. I also went into sort of a camera hole. Um, I, I now that I have a little bit of time to myself, finally, I want to get into um, using a flash and using off-camera flash, and I haven't done that before. So I've been doing a little research, and I'm going to try to find a uh, a cheapo cheapo flash. And I'm pretty sure you can hear the garbage truck in the background. Yep. Um, did I write? Uh, I, because I've sort of been calming down a little bit, uh, I've been a lot more free thinking and I've had like 10 ideas that I'm putting into my notebook at all times. Um, it used to be a notebook, now it's mostly a phone just because it's convenience reasons. Um, so I've been pretty, I've been pretty creatively exploratory, which is pretty nice. Um, on top of that, I uh, got queried, so I or I queried, so I sent in a couple pitches for projects I have. Excuse me, already written. So I wrote some pitches, but it, nothing, nothing creative on that front. Just, just writing like one pagers. Um, if you don't know what that is, it's basically a a pitch that you can fit into a page. I mean, that's it's. It's kind of like a resume for a show or a film. Um, as you know, you have like the, the log line, the show synopsis, maybe a little bit of characters, and then sort of where the story will go. That kind of thing. Uh, yeah. And one of the thing, one of the things I was writing is very, because um, I'm sort of making fun of the mockumentary format, which itself is making fun of the documentary format. Um, so there was a lot of explaining how I'm making fun of the mockumentary format and what that's going to look like, um, which is not creative, but it's also sort of necessary for the pitch. Anyway, so I wrote pitches. Uh, did I read? I did not. And I'm okay with that. Uh, what did I watch? Well, I watched the season finale of Barry, which was um, quite good. I have a feeling uh, Bill Hader's going to get uh, nominated for an Emmy for Best Actor because... I, it's incredible what he's doing, honestly. Uh, but the story's also quite good. So, Barry, high recommend. If you haven't seen it, go see it. Uh, I also saw the season finale for Silicon Valley, which I would argue last season was a little bit ho-hum and not very exciting. This season, a lot more fun, and it sort of went in a different direction, and the sort of the humor evolved a little bit, uh, and I appreciated it. I thought found the season finale to be thoroughly underwhelming compared to a lot of the other episodes of the season, but it was still pretty, pretty satisfying. So, uh, oh, I, I finally got into Lost in Space on Netflix. I think I'm on episode five or six now, and I never watched the original series because I'm not a million, uh, but I did watch the movie, which is incredibly flawed, but also I will always hold a candle for it because I really liked it. I, um, you know, it's, 
it's fun to have completely other planet space stories. I think they're super fun, and for whatever reason, they don't get made very much. Um, and the robot in Lost in Space, if you haven't seen it, is different every time, apparently. But, uh, but a major part of the show. So it's the Robinson family, and then a Dr. Smith character, who's usually a bad guy, but an ally. And then the robot. And I think in the old Lost in Spaces, the robot was their robot. Or it was Will, the son's robot, because Will is sort of like, kind of the main character. He's, he's sort of introverted and nerdy and the, young, the youngest son. And he had a robot. Um, but in this new one, there's a whole thing about how the robot got there, because it's not their robot. Um, which is interesting, although they're sort of angling it for a mystery, which I don't know if it's much of a mystery. Uh, but it's very interesting, I really like the robot. I will say the, the Netflix, um, not Will Robinson show, uh, Lost in Space show is very slow moving, especially considering there's like a major action set piece every single episode. It's incredibly slow moving. Um, but I'm on board. I like it. I really like most of the characters, except for sort of the bad guy. See, I have opinions about this. Um, so the bad guy in Lost in Space, like the per the perennial bad guy, is Dr. Smith, who is supposed to be part of the Robinson family as like a friend, but he's also secretly bad and does bad things. And this Dr. Smith is played by Parker Posey, and I think it's a it's it has problems for two reasons. The first reason is sort of the motivations and things that Dr. Smith does in this story don't ring true. They seem counterintuitive. They, they don't seem like that would ever make sense that Dr. Smith would do that for a bad guy or for a regular character. Um, but also, and I don't usually shit talk acting because I don't know anything about it, but I find Parker Posey's portrayal of Dr. Smith to be distractingly bad. Um, like, I groan every time it's a Dr. Smith scene because it's just, it's, it like takes me out of it. Um, maybe that was, maybe that was what Parker Posey was going for. And maybe that's how she was directed, honestly. I, you know, I can't, I can't say why it's not working, but I am registering that it's like undeniably that character's not working and, and sort of wrecks the show because of it. Uh, having said that, I'm going to keep watching Lost in Space, quite like it. Uh, love the robot. Love the robot and love the two sisters dynamics. Um, yeah, but I will always have a special place in my heart for the movie that wasn't very good, because uh, it just had a hilarious cast. It had um, Matt LeBlanc as their pilot, who's like flirtatious and handsome and charming, uh, sort of like a Han Solo type. Um, Gary Oldman was Dr. Smith, and Gary Oldman, uh, knocks every role out of the park no matter what, because he just, he, that's what he does. And then Heather Graham was the, was the Robinson's, uh, oldest daughter who was the doctor. Like, what a crazy, what a strange cast. Um, let me look up the other name of the girl, too, because she's, she was in, um, uh, uh, mean Girls. The the younger sister in the in the in that movie was in Mean Girls. Just like a very strange, uh, just a very strange cast of people who. Like it was kind of awesome. Uh, Lacey Chabert, uh, who was one of the Mean Girls, so just like. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to describe it. It's. If you haven't seen the old Lost in Space movie, old, uh, it's worth watching just because it's, like, the actual plot is, um, not very good, but it's just really funny to see, like, everything, how everything plays out with these actors because, you know, it was Matt LeBlanc when he was doing Friends, it was Heather Graham when she was basically on every TV show known to man, Gary Oldman was Gary Oldman. It was just like a weird, a weird moment in time, um, and somehow this very strange 
uh, pretty Hollywoody movie got made. So, uh, oh, I also watched. Uh, I finally brought myself to actually watch Sully because for some reason on YouTube every other clip is a clip from that movie Sully, Miracle on the Hudson, the guy who landed the plane. Um, yeah, I liked it. It was. Uh, it seemed short, but it also might have been because I've basically seen the movie in YouTube clips over the past six months. But it seemed like it was like a beat or two too. It felt like about twenty minutes too short to really deliver on what it was promising. Um, but it was good, and I, you know, it was basically a Tom Hanks vehicle, uh, and I think he did a pretty decent job, sort of teasing out this this pretty well-known American hero figure. So, yeah. Uh, writing tip. Obviously, I've been watching a lot more than I've been doing anything else. So, And I'm actually sort of, like, loosening up a little bit, finally. It's been six months of my project, and I'm chilling out about it. Uh, uh, writing tip. Write everything down. Um, this is specifically, I go, I go, I go like out of my way when I need to be creative to put myself in a free thinking environment. Uh, taking walks is super helpful. Um, I got back into running and I realized that after I'm just dog tired running and I, and I walk the cool down, well, you know, jog the cool down, then walk the, walk the like full cool down. I'm very, I'm very free thinking. I'm very associative, and it's very useful. So I think part of my daily routine now is going to be like a half hour of hard running, and then probably 20 minutes of just like free thinking, walking afterwards when my brain is shut off. So that seems to be working super well. Um, but you got to write it down. So I, I, we used to be that guy that had notebooks everywhere, like three notebooks under my bed, uh, a couple notebooks in my backpack, a notebook in my car. Um, out of convenience, it's pretty much all in my phone now. I just, unless it's something that has a lot of, a lot of words and a lot of nuance and I really need to properly handwrite it, because I do find that physically handwriting is super cognitively important. Um, but if it's just a one-off thought, I'll just throw it into notes on my phone. And I do it all the time, and, um, I'd say like, when I get time, so it's not a regular interval, but when I get time, I go back through the notes on my phone and just either put it in my computer or put, it in a t put everything into a notebook so that I go through it and I can sort of pick and choose what's a good idea, what I clearly didn't write enough of and doesn't make sense anymore, that kind of stuff. Um, but you gotta write it down because you never know when a useful idea is gonna find you, and it's usually not when you're ready for it. Um, if you sit down and be like, here's ideas, that's definitely not how I experience getting ideas. It's usually I'm stuck in traffic screaming at the car in front of me and stop traffic and then I go oh I have an idea and fortunately now we all have smartphones I just throw it in my smartphone so um, write everything down because even if it's a stupid idea you know a, a, a kilobyte of data wasted and you know and and two minutes of battery life on your phone is nothing um, so write it down and uh, Revisit it. I, I, I put a lot of stock into the idea of revisiting old ideas to see if they stand the test of time. Usually stuff I put in my phone doesn't, but uh, once in a while it does. So, write it all down. Uh, box office. I sucked. Um, mostly because Avengers just kept churning. By the way, I did see Avengers. I don't know if I mentioned that. I saw it. Uh, I think I liked it more than the real fans liked it. I think uh, the bad guy's motivations were um, incomplete, as is sort of the nature of Marvel bad guys. However, it it was as it was more complete than usual. Um, so yeah, I, I I think it was you know considering they were juggling a billion characters and. Um, nobody was special except for the bad guy I I can't really I can't complain um, the more you think about it the more the logic pratfalls show up but you know 
way better of a movie than I expected it to be, uh, just because too many too many cooks and too many spinning plates. Um, yeah, so not even not even up for debate about being the worst. It's not even it's not even in the lower tier of movies at all. Uh, okay, so let's see here. Uh, so I said last week, Avengers, Life of the Party, Overboard, Quiet Place, I Feel Pretty. And I got Avengers and Life of the Party right, and screwed everything else up. So, um, that movie breaking in about that um, African-American woman who's protecting her kids during a home invasion got number three. Uh, I heard it wasn't very good, but I wouldn't know. Uh, so that was number three. Number four was Overboard, which is what I thought was number three, um, which is that uh, Mexican guy who is, I would argue he's in a Mexican A-lister who is working in Hollywood, I think is the best way to describe it. He's re I like him, uh, but I didn't watch Overboard. Uh, and, then, and then number, f so that was number four, and then number five was A Quiet Place, which I thought was number four, uh, whatever. I also heard that it uh, very quickly got set up for a sequel, so they're already building a sequel and Don Krasinski's going to have a major hand in it. He's definitely going to direct it again, um, but he's also probably going to co-write it. Yeah, I'm cool with that. He did a really good job the first time, so uh, why not? So I got two out of five last week. Uh, this week I think it's really obviously going to be Deadpool. Um, just. Uh, an example of a of a movie that was never going to get made, that got made, did really well and got a sequel, and it seems like they did a really good job in the sequel. So Deadpool number one, Avengers number two, obviously, um, Book Club, which I don't know anything about, is I'm saying number three, Life of the Party number four, and Show Dogs, another thing I don't know anything about, number five. So uh, Deadpool's opening fresh, I believe Book Club this is the first week, and then Show Dogs is the first week. Uh, so. It seems like a pretty pretty easy easy spread of uh, of how it's going to be, but having said that, I haven't gotten five out of five in a very long time, and I don't expect to. Uh, additionally, uh, before I close it out, I'd want to do one more recommendation. Uh, you know how people people recommend books to read, that kind of thing. Um, there's a movie called Draft Day, I believe it came out in 2014. It was Kevin Costner, directed by Ivan Reitman, who's of Juno fame. No, that's Jason. Hold on, I screwed up. One second. Oh, okay, I screwed up. So, J so Jason Reitman, Ivan Reitman's son, directed uh, Juno, Ivan Reitman directed Draft Day. Uh, Draft Day has a weird history, and I don't know it fully. Um, by the way, Ivan Reitman does everything. He's known for Ghostbusters, and then more recently Up in the Air. Like he's he's a big deal. Uh, but he he directed this little tiny independent movie with Kevin Costner and Chadwick Boseman is in it as a football player, which I yeah I I kind of bought actually. Um, but it's about football, and of what I sort of gleaned, this this script draft day made the blacklist, which is, if you don't know about it, you need to Google the blacklist. It's sort of the Hollywood assistant's top list of what they're reading, um, with sort of the winking acknowledgement that these movies don't get made. Um, having said that, there's been like a hundred movies off the blacklist that went into production, like they actually do get made because of the notoriety and the internet now. Um, Draft Day was number one on the blacklist, I believe, 2012, either 2012 or 2011, like right when the blacklist started uh, officially. And uh, so it was technically a, a very good script. And then it went into turnaround, even though Kevin Costner was attached, and Ivan Reitman was attached. They finally got it made, and even as they were getting it made, um, they it was it's it's about NFL draft day. It's about American NFL draft day, uh, but it's 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 basically a character a character story about the owner uh, or the, the the team manager of the Cleveland Browns, 
so the so the guy who sort of controls the salaries and everybody and hirings played by Kevin Costner um, it's his responsibility to you know turn things around for the team in the form of the NFL draft which is a little hard to buy in that the NFL draft is notor like the more you know about it the more I could be proven wrong but it's notorious for drafting the wrong players that end up staying. Um, the example that I can think of is a while, a few years ago, um, this kid, uh, Johnny Football, Johnny Manziel, um, far and away the best player in college football in his, in his day. He, he was an entire level above that. However, uh, he liked to party, and he had a bad attitude, and he was really drinking his own Kool-Aid about how awesome he was. And uh, by about the time the draft happened, I think he got a DUI and he got something else, but he was just constantly in the news for scandal, which is not what you want when you're about to be drafted for tens of millions of dollars in the NFL. Uh, it, it put a bad taste on him, and everybody passed on him, and Cleveland ended up, ironically, Cleveland ended up getting him, and they played him... Uh, half the games that season and he sucked and they started him a couple times and he just sucked so he you know like the young hero that they that they paid a lot of money for but not as much as they could have was just a total burnout I'm not even sure if he's on the roster anymore he's a burnout so there's a lot of like well-known burnouts that got drafted for a lot of money and then just sucked because it's nobody knows anyway uh, draft day uh, is also about the Cleveland Browns, but it wasn't supposed to be. It was supposed to be about Seattle. Let me think. Uh, I don't know. Anyway. Um, it wasn't supposed to be Seattle, or it wasn't supposed to be Cleveland. It was supposed to be somebody else. Um, but so it was, it was about whatever this team was. I should have done more research. I had it the other day and I lost it. Um, but it's it's basically from the point of view of the Cleveland Browns uh, manager yeah, as he's trying to uh, sort of put all the chess pieces in place up until and through draft day, uh, day one of the draft in order to turn his team around and so it's him and his office staff and the team coach and then and then some of the main players and then and then also there's like they're throwing it to other teams in other cities who are also coordinating because it's one big sort of like poker game uh board, you know across America where each team is in their stadium sort of coordinating their plan and their picks and stuff which is super nerdy and not all that interesting but uh, tracking Kevin Costner's character, it's really fascinating because he's, uh, it's very, it's very classically told where, um, every time somebody comes in with new information, it changes the story and he has to make a decision that derails the last decision. And, uh, it's very much everybody dislikes him, he makes a move and they're on his side, and then every move after that, they hate him more and more and more until he, at the hope at the end, can possibly justify just wrecking everything uh, through the lens of uh, American football, which is a little masturbatory, but whatever. Um, it's a really, it's a really sweet, charming story, and it's very intense and it's very uh, high paced. Like you're trying to keep up with the thinking of the of the of Kevin Costner's Kevin Costner's character the whole time because you have all these sort of like elements. So it's not really a thriller or a mystery, but it sort of plays out like that, where it's very, it's very intense and it's very by the minute. It's told in one day and it's basically told in real time. It's very, it's very intense. Um, high recommend, honestly. Uh, but it eventually got made, so it got in, it got put in turnaround in 2012, which basically means it got thrown away. Uh, but then they ended up making it a year and a half later, or a year later. Um, it didn't do very well in the box office, but honestly, the script is is just tight. So if you want to if you want to write like a thriller or detective story or something like that, it's worth watching Draft Day just to see how the filmmakers sort of shaped the ongoing of 
a new person comes in with new information, he has to reset and, and dig deep and make a decision that may not play out in the next moment, but will play out three moments later. It's a lot of, it's basically you're watching movie chess. Uh, I have a lot to say about it, apparently. Um, anyway, it's been 25 minutes, and uh, that's embarrassing, considering the last one was seven. Um, right stuff.